Scripture reading this morning will be taken from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Ephesians 1, 1 through 3. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Well, good morning, brethren and friends. We're happy to see you here on a beautiful Lord's Day morning. Grateful that you could come out and assemble with us this morning. Truly, it's a wonderful opportunity that we have to assemble together and to worship our Heavenly Father. We're grateful that we've been able to do so this morning. Thankful to all the men who have led us in worship up to this point and those who will uh, before the morning hour is over. And uh, grateful to those who are with us but not in this building uh, uh, for uh, reasons with the pandemic and otherwise still uh, staying away from uh, the building. We understand that. And thank you for joining us just the same. Our study this morning will begin in Genesis chapter 6. If you would like to open your Bible in Genesis chapter 6, notice Jake read for us from Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. In just a moment, we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 6 and notice located blessings. But before that, let me remind you of your weekly challenges. We added a new one last week, that of reaching out to an erring member of the church. Not those who are not able to come because of the pandemic, but those who have left the church some time ago, maybe during the pandemic, but uh, those who have left the church, those who are no longer faithful. I'd remind you that that was the uh, newest challenge, the one given last week, and we'll hold on to it for a couple of weeks before adding another new one, but I hope that, uh, I hope that you'll heed to this challenge. I hope you'll reach out to someone, a call or visit, whatever it might be. Encourage uh, someone that you know to come back, to come back to the Lord's church. Tell them they are loved, they're missed. We want them back. We hope that you'll do that. By the way, I heard from a couple of different ones uh, in the past week or two on the copy one book of the Bible word for word. Many of you are choosing the book of James, and I appreciate that. One told me just yesterday that developing on that, decided to have a verse a day for the rest of the year, going to copy one verse a day for the rest of the year. I thought that was a great idea, and the Hatton family is telling me that uh, they all chose the book of Titus, but each one uh, copied it from a different translation. And then they went and um, compared the different translations. So I thought that was a good idea as well. Thank you for meeting these challenges, and thank you for giving me ideas during these challenges. Located blessings throughout the history of man. He has needed God's blessings. God has always been willing to pour out His blessings upon mankind. I think God is willing to bless us more than he does. Sometimes we restrict God's blessings. Sometimes the lives that we're living, the things we're doing, we will not allow God to give us full blessings. I truly believe that, that God is just, just holding them back sometimes, ready to pour them out upon us. Be sure to live your life to the fullest and live your life to receiving God's blessings, not in a selfish way, but in a way that God wants to do it for you. God is ready to do it for you. And throughout the Bible, we're going to notice four or five examples this morning of people who needed God's blessings, and God was willing to share His blessings with them, but they were located. They were located to a specific place. In Genesis chapter 6, we begin reading in verse 1. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, beginning, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now, some people will try to have this as angels uh, with humans. I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's simply evil men with righteous people. I think that's simply the case. The evil people of, of, of the day, uh, they, they, were, uh, they were with the righteous people having children. And the same problems we can have today when a righteous person, a Christian, marries someone who's not in the faith, and then it's pulled away, pulls out, gets pulled out into the world. Notice verse 3, the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There again, some will look to this verse and say that man cannot live past the age of 120. I, I would not agree with that. Uh, after the flood, you see people living longer than 120 years old. I think he's talking about the time from... 
uh, when Noah was given his commission to build the ark until the floodwaters came was about 120 years is what I think Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3 is saying. Continuing on in verse 4, there were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Verse 5, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. There's a difference in making a mistake. And your thoughts are only evil continually. But mistakes can lead into habits. Can lead into a life of only evil. That's what was going on in the days of Noah. I know there's a lot of evil in this world. There's a lot of evil in this nation. If you look around this morning, there's a lot of good also. We need not forget that. If we're not careful, we'll focus only on the evil. and We'll forget that which is good. We'll forget uh, those who, who are trying to do what is right. We'll think like, we'll think like Elijah. We're going to go study 1 Kings chapter 17 a little later this morning. We'll think like Elijah did and think that we're all alone. They were only evil continually. Verse 6, the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Notice this in first, uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 7. God's going to destroy the animal kingdom as well. So of course, he's going to preserve some on the ark. And you see that also in the prophets when you study the prophets. That many times the, the, the animal kingdom that, that, that God created... They suffer because of the hands of, of people, of evil peoples. Many times all of God's earth has suffered because of the decisions that we have made. That's not to say that you can't eat meat or anything like that. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that many, many times they have suffered. The world has suffered because of the decisions that we make. If you continue on in Genesis chapter 6, going back to verse 7, I am sorry that I have made them. Drop down to verse 13. God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. There was a need in Noah's day and time. The, the earth was only evil continually. God was going to destroy the world with water. Noah needed God's salvation. Noah needed saved through this, Noah needed saved, and, and all of the world did. They just did not realize it. The difference with Noah is, if you go back to verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You may be one in a thousand. You may be one in a million. You may be one in all of the world. But you can still serve God faithfully. You can still find grace in the eyes of the Lord. You go back to that statement I made a moment ago, 120 years if that, if that should be the case, that here is Noah and his wife, their sons and their da uh, and daughters-in-law, and for 120 years, you're the one that finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. And for 120 years, you're the one that remains faithful to God when everybody else, sometimes we give up, do we not? We'll be faithful for a little while, but eventually it'll overtake us. But that wasn't the case with Noah. Noah needed God's blessings. God was going to destroy the world with this water and Noah needed God's blessings. And God was ready and willing to give Noah such blessings. But they were located. They were located in a specific place. Go back to verse 13. or Let's, let's begin in verse 14. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. And he gives them the dimensions of the ark. We're not going to continue on it, but God is locating his blessings for Noah. Noah, I need you to build an ark. If, if you want to survive this flood, if you want to live through this flood, you need to build this ark. He gave him the instructions. He gave him the blueprints. He gave him the dimensions for this ark. God was locating his blessings because this worldwide flood, water is covering all of the world. There's nowhere that Noah could go to for safety. There's nothing Noah could do on his own for safety. There's no way to escape this flood. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1. 
Noah prepares the ark as God has instructed him to do so. And in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1, the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark. Notice that, come into the ark. Now, if you step away from the Bible and you tell the story of Noah and the ark, you're likely to say God said to Noah, go into the ark, because that's how we would think, is it not? But notice where God's blessings are located. God's blessings are located where he is. God's blessings are only located where he is. It's chapter 7 and verse 1. Come into the ark. If you want to receive God's blessings, you must go to where God is. God was in the ark. Come into the ark, you and your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You see, in the last verse of chapter 6, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him. God gave Noah blessings, but Noah had to go where God told him to go to receive the blessings. Open your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20. 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter uses Noah in teaching us uh, about the baptism. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20 beginning, Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Notice that again. The divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. Side note, how patient has God been with you? Think about that. The long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah waited year after year, waited this 120 years. God waited his long suffering for Noah to prepare this ark. First Peter chapter 3 in verse 20, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. King James says by water. These eight souls were saved through water or by water. Verse 21, there's also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Noah's day, a flood was coming. God was sorry they created the world. God, God he, he, he was relenting of this. He was going to destroy all of the world, and he did so. But he saved Noah and his family through the water, by the water. God was willing to give a blessing to Noah because he was a righteous man, because he found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but Noah had to go to a specific place in order to receive God's blessings. It was located. What do you think would have happened if Noah, on that day when God said, come into the ark, if Noah would have said, no, I don't think I'm going to. What do you think would have happened if Noah would have said, I, I think I'm going to stay on the outside, or I, I'm not ready to go in, or I, I don't want to do that. What do you think would have happened to Noah and his family? Furthermore, for those who are outside of the ark, when that door was shut and that rain started falling and that water started rising, do you think they realized the importance of God's blessings and going to where God says he will bless you? Located blessings. Open your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17, there was a man named Elijah and there was a drought. Elijah had prayed for this drought. And in 1 Kings chapter 17, God is willing to bless Elijah, a prophet of God, a man of God, a servant of God. God is willing to bless him, but it's a located blessing. And, and the location in the case of Elijah changed. 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse 1, And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Here's the importance of, I mentioned last week, those questions that you need to ask yourself. That sixth question that I asked myself, where else in the Bible is this subject discussed? Nowhere in 1 Kings chapter 17, 18, or 19 do you learn how long this drought lasted. As far as I know, nowhere in the Old Testament do you learn that. But if you go to the New Testament in James chapter 5 and Luke chapter 4, you learn that it was a drought of three and a half years. That's why it's important when you're studying a Bible subject to say, well, what else does the Bible have to say about that? Here's a drought, a drought of three and a half years. The word of the Lord came to Elijah saying in verse 2, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. It's a drought. God is going to bless Elijah. God is going to give Elijah food and water. Again, remember, this drought is going on, but it's located 
located blessings. God says to him in verse 4, And it will be that you, when you drink from the brook, I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. God tells Elijah, you go to this brook. You go to this specific place. And there you can have water. And there the ravens will feed you. Located blessings. Continue on. 1 Kings chapter 17 beginning in verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Here, here as, as, as 1 Kings chapter 17 begins, God tells Elijah, you go to this brook, you go to this specific place, and there you will be blessed. What happens if Elijah goes anywhere else? Certainly God's not going to take care of him, is he not? I mean, he, why, why, would he, why would he take care of him if he, if he disobeyed God? And, and now you have him tell him, go to this specific widow. Open your Bible to the book of Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. In verse 25. This, this is important for our study this morning. But this is also important because sometimes when you're studying the Bible with people, you, you'll hear them try to argue against what the Bible says by saying, well, where does the Bible say not to? You know, that comes up often with the, su the subject of, of how we are to sing and worship and if we can use instrument or not. And that comes up with other Bible subjects as well, but especially in that one. Notice this, in Luke chapter 4, and verse 25, Jesus said, I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months. There's your three and a half years. And there was a great famine throughout all the land. Do you understand a little more about Elijah's need? Elijah had a need for water. Elijah had a need for food. God was willing to provide. God was willing to give him these blessings. But they were located in specific places. In verse 26, But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Jesus is saying in these verses, look, there were many widows throughout the region. There are many widows throughout the land. But Elijah was told to go to this specific widow. From her and her only was God going to bless Elijah. Now what does that tell us in today's day and time when people say, well, where did God say not to? God did not have to tell Elijah every widow uh, in the land and every widow not to go to. God said, go to this widow and that was the only one that Elijah had God's authority to go to. No one else. Just this one. It excludes all else. Second Kings chapter 5. Located blessings. Open your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. In the case of Naaman. 2 Kings chapter 5 beginning in verse 1. The located blessings. Here is a need. Noah's day had a need. He needed to be saved. The flood was coming. Elijah's day, he had a need. He needed food. He needed water. Here's a man who is not even an Israelite. Naaman. Here's a man who has a need. 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. But he was also, he was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. Here's a man who has a need. He is a leper. I don't know to what extent he has leprosy. I don't know. Some believe because the Bible says he was a leper. Maybe it was a mild case of it, but, but still he's a leper. Because, you know, later uh, when, when, when the one uh, from Elisha goes to take from Naaman and take the goods from Naaman, he becomes covered in leprosy. But he, whatever the case is, he's a leper. He has, he, he, he has so, so, leprosy. He, he is a leper. He has a need. He needs healed from this awful disease. Notice verse 2. The Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back a captive young girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. Notice verses 2 and 3 for just a moment. Here, here, here was a young girl, this young captive girl. She could have said, you know what? I don't deserve this. I'm not going to tell this man about Elisha. I'm not going to tell this man 
uh, uh, about who can help him. I'm not going to tell him about Israel. I'm not going to tell him any of this. That could have been her attitude. Why do I want to help you? But I think we read about a, a very humble attitude of this young captive girl. She didn't look at life as all the things that happened to me. She just was simply continuing to do what she knew to do. And she was considering even the welfare of others. She tells Naaman where he can go, and where he can become healed, where, who he can see to be healed. Continuing on in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse uh, 4, Naaman went and told his master thus and thus. So Naaman gets sent. He gets sent to the king of Israel. Notice Notice verse 7. It happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and he said, this young captive girl was closer to God than the king of Israel in this case and in this situation. This young captive girl knew more about Elisha than the king. This young captive girl says, I'll tell you where you can go, but the king, he's upset about it. Tears his clothes. There's nothing I can do for him. Continuing on in verse 8. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he said to the king, saying, Why have you done this? Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Naaman went with him, horses and chariots, and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Notice verse 10. Elisha sends a messenger out to him. You know this. You've read it many, many times. Elisha, I think, was teaching Naaman a little something about humility. He doesn't even go out to meet the guy. He sends someone out to meet him. Elisha sends this messenger in verse 10. He says, go and wash in the Jordan seven times. Naaman had a need. Naaman had a disease. Naaman was a leper. God was willing to cure Naaman. God was willing to give Naaman a blessing. He didn't cure all the lepers. He didn't provide relief to all the lepers. But in this case, he was willing to cure Naaman. But in verse 10, as we read, it was a located blessing. He had to go to a specific place in order to receive God's blessings. And he had to do what God said to do. Elisha sends the messenger and he tells him, go to the Jordan River. And as you know, Naaman would even ask, you know, what about these other rivers? They're cleaner. They're not, they're, are they not better? But it had to be this river, the Jordan River, and he had to dip seven times. Six wasn't enough. Eight was too much. Here was a man who had to go to where God told him to go in order to receive the blessings that God was willing to give. Located blessings. As you continue to read, you see Naaman eventually, Naaman eventually, he humbles himself, pushes his pride to the side, he goes to the Jordan, dips seven times and he comes up clean. John chapter 9. Open your Bible to John chapter 9. Loca you, you could spend all day, we could spend the rest of the day Noticing located blessings. I just, I just picked out a few to share with you this morning. But we can, we can look at them all day long. In John chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Here's a man who's blind. He has a need. He, he, he needs eyesight. He wants his eyesight. Of course, a lot of blind people in our Lord's day, but he didn't heal them all. He didn't raise everyone from the dead. He did not give everyone the ability to, to walk who had been paralyzed. He chose some for certain purposes to prove that he is God. But here's a man who is blind. And, and Jesus would tell him, and let's begin in verse 6. When Jesus had said these things, he spat on the ground and he made clay with saliva and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sin. So he went and washed and he came back seeing. Here God was willing to give this blind man sight. God was willing to let him see. Jesus, in this case, took his spit, took his saliva, made a little clay, put it on his eyes, told him to go to this specific place, the pool of Siloam. There, could have, there were many bodies of water where he could have went and washed. He could say, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to this place. Let me just wipe it off. Do something else. Perform a miracle a different way. God said to do it this way. I'm willing to bless you. I've located your blessing. It's in the pool of Siloam. If you'll go there and you'll wash, you'll come up seeing. And sure enough, he did. John chapter 9 and verse, verses 1 through 7. Now go to Romans chapter 6. You know how all of this applies to us. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin is death. 
Noah needed to be saved because flood waters were coming to destroy the world. Elijah needed food and water. Naaman needed heal. The blind man needed sight. Brethren and friends, you and I need salvation from sin. That's more important than receiving sight. That's more important than receiving ability to walk. That's more important than eating. That's more important than anything you do. There's many wonderful people in this world who have accomplished so much. But I want you to stop and think with me for a moment. You take the work of a surgeon, for example. I've not had to see one yet. Hopefully I'll never have to see one, but maybe one day I will. No doubt some of you have. Aren't you grateful for those who have studied and excelled in their fields and can help us in our quality of life? Take a brain surgeon, for example. Could you imagine that? Could, 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 could you imagine performing such a surgery in the inner workings of one's brain? But the work of a brain surgeon, the very best work he could ever do is delay death. I mean, the very best work he could ever do is delay death. Salvation from sin is greater than that. You and I have sin. You, you, you and I all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of the sin is death. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. You see the, 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 the fornicators, the murderers, the adulterers, and who is coupled with them? All liars. God has located his blessings. God is willing to pour his blessings out upon us. But they're located in Christ only. As Jake read for us in Ephesians chapter 1 in verse 3. It's in Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 10. Salvation is in Christ. Open your Bible to Acts chapter 4. Salvation is in Christ. In Acts chapter 4 Let's begin in verse 11. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And you go back and you know he's talking about Jesus. The only place in which we receive God's blessings today is in Christ. Every blessing, all blessings are in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. The only place of salvation is in Christ. The, 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 the only place that we can go to heaven is in or through Christ. We must realize that. We must understand that. The world in, in, its, in its ways of trying to accept all will say, hey, you can have your God. But they're saying your God is, is just the same as anyone else's God. You cannot limit it. God limited it. The creator of this world limited it. When he sent his son to die, and his son died on the cross for your sins, that limited it. The, the, the Bible, the Holy Bible that you read, inspired by the Holy Spirit, limits it. It's in Christ only. Noah, if he wouldn't have been in the ark, what would have happened? Elijah, if he would have went somewhere else, what would have happened? Naaman, if he would have went to another river, what would have happened? The blind man, if he would not have went to the pool of Salaam, what happens? You and I, if we're not in Christ, what happens? No blessings. No salvation. We want to help you to get in Christ this morning if you're not there already. Of course, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. When you're baptized, you're baptized into Christ. If this morning you're not in Christ, we want to help you to get there. As a believer, repenting of your sins, putting on Christ in baptism, rising to rejoice, to live this new life and serve God faithfully. We want to help you to return to Christ. Maybe you were there and you left this located blessing. Maybe, maybe you left the location of God's blessings. I'm not talking about this building. I'm talking about salvation of the Lord's church, the people. Maybe you've left it. And you say, I want to return and get into Christ once again, praying to God 
for forgiveness as you repent of your sins is how you do so if you've already been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. God's blessings are here. He's ready to pour them out upon you. They're located. They're located. Let us help you get in the proper location as we stand and as we sing.